Greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your past reality. I wish you all, especially the United States, a very blessed the 4th of July weekend. Let us come together now for another chapter of prayer. Unanswered prayer, living with the mystery. Some, but not all, unanswered prayers trace back to a fault in the one who prays. Some, but not all, trace back to God's mystifying respect for human freedom and refusal to curse. Some, but not all, trace back to the dark powers contending against God's rule. Some, but not all, trace back to a planet marital disease, violence, and the potential for tragic accident. How, then, can we make sense of any single experience of an unanswered prayer? I take odd comfort in the fact that the Bible itself includes numerous prayers that went unanswered. Although, we can only speculate why God does not answer a given prayer. And these biblical examples laid down useful clues. After leading the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years, Moses pled with God to him to allow him to accompany them across the Jordan River before he died. God refused this request as punishment for Moses' past outburst, which so rankled Moses that four times in his speeches to the Israelites in Deuteronomy he lashed out blaming them for God's refusal. On other occasions, Moses had talked God into changing his mind. Not this time. King David spent the week prostrate and spurning all food, praying that his infant son not die. As a consequence of his grievous sin, that prayer went unanswered. David then Sheba lost a child, and nevertheless, a later union led to the birth of Solomon, who would rule over Israel's golden age. Four characters in the Old Testament, Moses, Job, Jonah, and Elijah, actually prayed to die. Fortunately for them, God ignored their requests. Several times, the armies of Israel prayed for victory over their enemies and only to suffer humiliating defeats. Each event prompt soul-searching. Did the army act precipitously against God's orders? Had some soldier committed a war crime that displeased God? The prophet Habakkuk prayed for deliverance from the Babylonians, and Jeremiah prayed that Jerusalem not be destroyed. Both prophets' prayers went unanswered, and each struggled to explain the reason to a defeated nation. You have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer could get through, lamented the prophet in a book aptly titled Lamentation. I've mentioned some of the twelve disciples' inappropriate prayers, such as calling for fire from heaven against a town. In one instance, the disciples proved unable to perform a miracle of healing and seemed puzzled by the failures. See Matthew 17 and Mark 9. Jesus used the opportunity to rebuke their lack of faith. And although the disciples' prayers had gone unanswered, clearly it was God's will that the boy be healed, for Jesus then accomplished what they could not. The Apostle Paul had his share of unanswered prayers. You need only read his luminous prayers for churches and then read the sad record of those churches to realize how far short they fell of the ideal for which he prayed. In his most famous unanswered prayer, Paul pleaded with the Lord three times for the renewal 
removal, I mean removal of the thorn in my flesh. Any model responds to a negative answer he put behind him, the disappointment of not getting what he wanted and instead accepted what he got. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sakes, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Not even Jesus was exempt from unanswered prayer. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed with both the faith of protest and the faith of acquiescence. He turned for help first to God, pleading, Let this cup pass, then to his friends who were sound asleep, and then to the religious rulers who accused him, and then to the state which sentenced him, then to the people who rejected him. And finally, he uttered that awful cry of derelictions. My God, why have you forsaken me? For C.S. Lewis, that sequence of helplessness illustrates the human situations writ large. Every rope breaks when you says it, says it and every door is slammed shut as you reach it. From these unanswered prayers, I gain a glimmer of insight into the riddle of prayer. What if David's sons had lived and reigned as king instead of Solomon? What if the prophet's prayers had been answered and Israel had established itself as a world power, its citizens holding their religion tied to their chests, unshared with the world? What if Paul had been healed, making him a more agile missionary, perhaps both, but one of the insufferable pride as he feared? Finally, what if Jesus has received the answer he prayed for in a moment of dread? His rescue would have been, have meant the planet's ruin. And C.S. Lewis observes the essence of request. As distinct from compulsion is that it may or may not be granted. And if an infinitely wise being listen to the requests of finite and foolish creatures, of course he would sometimes grant and sometimes refuses them. Invariable successes in prayer would not prove the Christian doctrine at all. It would prove something much more like magic. It is unreasonable for a headmaster to say such and such things you may do according to the fixed rules of this school. But such and such other things are too dangerous to be left to general rules. If you want to do them, you must come and make a request and talk over the whole matter with me in my study, and then we'll see. Sweeping Promises as Lewis acknowledged, the real problem lies not in the fact of refusal, but in the, the Bible's lavish promises. In a nutshell, the main difficulty which unanswered prayers is that Jesus seemed to promise there need not be any. Jesus could have said something like this, I am bestowing the gifts of prayer. You must realize, of course, that humans cannot have perfect wisdom, so there are limits as to whether your prayers will be answered. Prayer operates like a suggestion box. Spell out your requests clearly to God, and I guarantee that all requests will be carefully considered. That kind of statement about prayer I can easily live with. Instead, here is what Jesus said. I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt you can say to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Again, I tell you, what if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for? It will be done for you by my Father in heaven. 
and therefore I tell you. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This represents just a sampling of the New Testament's sweeping claims made in plain language. Some preachers say on this passage as a kind of club, flogging the church for not taking them literally and faulting believers for having too little faith. But how to account for the un unanswered prayers of Jesus and Paul? And how can we reconcile the lavish promises with the actual experience of so many sincere Christians who struggle with unanswered prayers? One possible explanation centers in the specific group of people whom Jesus was addressing to the disciples. Could it be that Jesus gave the twelve handpicked to carry on the work after his death? Certain rights and privileges in prayer that would not be normative for every follower. The gospel writers do not explicitly say these commands apply to the disciples only, but they do specify in each case that Jesus was speaking to his intimate disciples, not a large group, a large crowd. Jesus invested in the disciples a unique discernment into God's will. Everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. He told them at the Last Supper, after spending three years schooled directly by Jesus, they would presumably have a good idea of which prayers would further God's purpose and on earth and which would be capricious or self-serving. Yet the letters credited to Peter and John showed that prayer did not operate like magic for the disciples either. And those two, like Paul, express frustration over developments in the church contrary to their prayers. And historians tell of the martyrdom of ten of the disciples. Surely the prayer, let this cup pass, must have run through their minds at some point. Another explanation for, uh, focuses on the fine print that modifies the lavish promises, and virtually all of them contain a qualifier, such as whatever you ask in my name, or if you remain in me and my words remain in you. The assurance of unanswered prayers still sweeping in its scoop comes with conditions. Am I abiding in Christ? Am I making requests according to his will? Am I obeying his commands? Each of these underscores the relationships, the companionship with God. The more we know God, the more we know God's will, the more likely our prayers will align with that will. After pondering this problem for years and discussing it with about every Christian I know, learned or simply lay or clerical within my own communion or without, C.S. Lewis finally concluded that the kind of dawnless faith called by Jesus occurs only when the one who prays us so as God's fellow workers demand what is needed for the joint work. It is the prophets, the apostles, the missionaries, the healer's prayer that is made with this confidence something of the divine foreknowledge enters his mind. In other words, one who works in close partnership with God grows in the ability to discern what God wants to accomplish on earth and prays accordingly. A time to wait. In no way do I mean to delude the majestic promises about prayer given by Jesus, James, John, and others in the New Testament. God knows, truly, God knows. I need more of the bold and simple faith 
those passages call for. On the other land, I mean on the other hand, considering them in isolation leads to a name it and claim it. Mentality that ignores much other revelations. The same Jesus who spoke of faith has a mustard seed also gave us the story about the widow wearing down a judge with her persistence. And all through the the Bible, spiritual giants, giants wrestling with God in their prayers, as we have seen. Jesus himself set limits to the request he made. Take this cup, he asked, and then added the modifier about the Father's will. He prayed that the Peter's faith would hold firm, but not that Peter avoid all testing. He declined the prayer for angels' help in rescuing him from execution. So, too, we have all set limits to our prayers. Some things we can ask for unconditionally, such as forgiveness and compassion for the poor and progress in growing a fruit of the Spirit. Other requests are conditional, such as Paul's plea for relief from the torrent. Some who refrain from asking out of respect for the natural laws that govern the planet. I pray that God will help my uncle cope with diabetes, but not that God restore his amputated leg. Nor do I pray that God would shift the orbit of planet Earth to counteract global warning, uh, warming. Instead, I ask what my own role should be in helping my uncle and in addressing environment concerns. I also learn as I ponder the mystery of unanswered prayer simply to wait. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due seasons we shall reap if we faint not. Daniel waited three weeks for an answer to his prayer, seeking guidance in the midst of war. Jeremiah waited ten days before receiving an answer. After climbing Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, Moses waited six days before hearing God's voice, and Jesus too waited. When he performed an impressive miracle, his followers wanted to spread the word immediately, and Jesus hushed them. My time has not yet come. He understood something about God that was impatience types overlook. God acts slowly. Think of the centuries that passed between the disruption caused by Adam and the reconciliation brought by Jesus. Centuries that include Abraham's waiting for a child, the Israelites waiting for liberation, the prophets waiting for the Messiah. Biblical history tells a meandering, zigzag tale of dog legs and detours. God's plan unfolds like a leisurely opera not a top 40 tune. For those of us caught in any one phrase of opera, especially a mournful phrase, the music may seem unbearable sad. Onward moves at deliberated speed and with great effort. The very tedium, the act of waiting itself, works to nourish in us qualities of patience Persistence, trust, gentleness, compassion, or it may do so if we place ourselves in the stream of God's movement on earth. It may take more faith to trust God when we do not get what we ask for than when we do. Is that not the point of Hebrews 11? That chapter includes the poignant comment that the heroes of faith were commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. It then intertwines their frustrate destiny with ours. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Fate 
cause us to trust in a future-oriented God. Scoffers will call such a pledge into questions. As the Bible freely admits, they will say, Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of the creation. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. With all the time in the world, God waits, tolerating the insults of human history out of mercy, not impotence. Even Psalms, the Bible's prayer book, so profuse with groans and laments, circles back repeatedly to the theme of God's faithfulness. And no matter how circumstances appear at any given moment, we can trust the fact that God will still rule the universe. The divine reputation rests on a solemn pact that one day all shall be well. God's smile. The theologian, theologian, sorry, Ronald Goods calls himself an occasionist. God acts in response to prayer, and he believes, but with baffling, unpredictably. Of course, most of us pray with baffling, unpredictably too. Review the alternatives, though. God called act alone, ignoring us and our prayers. Our God could leave matters entirely in our hands with no direct in involvement in human history. The first option contradicts the whole motive behind creating personal beings made in God's image. The second opinion is too ominous to contemplate. We have instead a relationship with God based on constant negotiation. We inform God of the thing should be done in the world, and in the process God reminds us of our own role in doing it. Rarely do we get everything we want, and I imagine the same holds true for God. The trail of God at work rarely follows a straight line, which means our prayers may well produce different answers than we expect. For whatever reason, God's sense of irony, antagonistic spiritual powers, the vicissitudes of a fallen planet, prayers get answered in ways we could neither predict nor imagine. How must Mary have looked back on our great prayer, the Magnificat? As she saw Jesus crucified by the very rulers, she had hoped he would vanish. I mean, vanquish. And Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, who had prophesied salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. What did he think as he watched his son John grow into an insect eating dissident who get God? beheaded by one of those enemies. Both families prayed fervently, and neither got the answer they expected. An Apostle's Prayer The Apostle Paul had one overriding desire that 
fellow Jews would embrace the Messiah he had encountered on the road to Damascus. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, he said, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sakes of my brothers, those of my own race, the peoples of Israel. No doubt Paul prayed to that end daily, yet seldom saw its answered. In city after city, his fellow Jews rejected him, and he turned to the Gentiles. I see in Paul's response to that disappointment and ideal pattern of coping with an unanswered prayer. In the first place, he did not simply make a request and resign himself to God's decision. Paul, the human agent, put feet to his prayer, making a habit of going first to the synagogue when he entered a new town, often at great personal cost, as his visits led to triad. Furthermore, Paul persevered even when it became increasingly clear that his prayer was not being answered. Apparently, however, Paul did grow weary. In his most elegant letter, he sets as his center's piece, Roman 9 to 11, a passionate passage, a verbal wrestling match with God in which he struggles openly with this, the great unanswered prayer of his life. Paul acknowledged one important set benefits, the surprise factor of this most distressing development, the Jews. Rejecting of Jesus led to his acceptance by the Gentiles. It seems strange, he admits, that the Gentiles who did not pursue God's gift attained it, whereas the Jews who did pursue it have been attained it, not yet anyway. Paul is trying to make sense of his history, a very personal history. Sometimes his passion interrupts. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. He plows over the same ground, looking for something he may have missed, and he concludes that God hasn't rejected the Jews. To the contrary, they have the same opportunity as Gentiles. God has widened it, not closed, the embrace of humanity. The prose begins to soar as Paul steps back to consider the big picture, and then comes this burst of doxology in the midst of Paul's dissertation on a unanswered prayers. Oh, the depths of riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the minds of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. In a flash, Paul has gained a glimpse of the view from the top of the mountain, not Timberland. The view from Andromeda, not Rome. In that glimpse, somehow the doleful events of history and theologians' mind, numbing Theodices. The unsolved mysteries and unanswered prayers of fate to gray against the technicolor panorama of God's plan for the ages. God is the potter, we are the clay. God is the father, we are the children. Perhaps more accurately, God is the playwright, we are the actors. That prayer exists at all is a gift of grace a generous invitation to participate in the future of the cosmos. In the end, unanswered prayer brings me face to face with the mystery that silenced Paul, that silenced Paul, the profound difference between my perspective and God's. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yeah. 
May this lesson, this encouragement, can bring some answers to your heart, or the desire to see that prayers be answered. God will always be the same. He will never change. He is longing for all of us to have a close relationship, a very deep intimacy. And if you go to a, a dryness or a feeling that God is not listening, Maybe make it quiet in your hearts. Maybe we come to a silent place, a quiet place. Maybe God is waiting. Maybe you have to wait. Don't let unanswered prayers you disconnect from God. We'll bring you more to the deepness, the deepest understanding or the deepest acceptance of this mystery of unanswered prayers bring you to a intimacy that you never had before. Don't stop praying, but listen to your own words and let the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit speak to your hearts. May God brings you to awakeness, awareness. Because sometimes we also fall asleep. Let God wake you up. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.